Tell him, McCluskey. Tell him what time it is. Little Hand says it's time to rock and roll. All you people are so scared of me. Come quietly or there will be trouble. Man, that's just me. I'm Batman. This is Sparta! There is a tiger in the bathroom. I'm an excellent driver. If it bleeds, we can kill it. Pop quiz, hot shot. Keep the change, you filthy animal. I am black. And I bid you welcome, Mr. Harkin, to my house. Hello and welcome to this week's Monday Movie Show. I'm Stuart with the slightly froggy kind of throat, but that's my fault. You don't sound too bad, actually. I'm Andrew, um, with the normal annoying kind of voice. Yeah, you should have heard me yesterday then, because you wouldn't have been able to. Because I had absolutely no voice, but it's self-inflicted. I went out with a few friends on Saturday night in a rock bar, got carried away, start singing along to the songs, and completely lost my voice. Isn't that so... a bit of a throat part? You should have heard me yesterday, but of course you couldn't because you couldn't say anything. Yeah, exactly. That's why I said it. Yeah, I, I did. Yeah, so, yeah, we're not here to... As usual, we always start the show with sort of like just nothing to do with movies. Mm. It, it's always yeah. either we're on a different deer and I'm mourning about the fact but, that we're not on a Monday, which we are it's tonight. Like, it's like there's a whole world out there of other things not films related. Even though we are a movie show, it's nice to start <laughs> like that, isn't it? Just to <laughs> ease people into the fact that... Yeah, we do more other things apart from watch films all the time, yeah. even though that probably takes up about nine-tenths of our spare time. Yeah, they don't but, believe us, but we can try. <laughs> yeah, considering how much we're reviewing this week. Yeah, it would, it's a hectic week today. It's a majorly hectic week, especially in the cinema section, we're looking at these films. Uh, Luke Evans is playing the, the new version of Dracula in Dracula Untold. We have uh, David Fincher, my personal favourite director, uh, returning with an adaptation of a very popular book, Gone Girl. Um, we have a sequel to Dolphin Tale with Dolphin Tale 2, which is another based on a true story thing. Um, you have um, Draft Day with Kevin Costner uh, in a, an American football drama. And uh, then there's the small indie zombie film uh, Life After Beth. Yeah, and on Blu ray and DVD, we have even more films. We're looking at yeah. these ones. Um, Seth. I would say Seth Rogen. It's not Seth Rogen, is it? Seth McFarlane. Um, McFarlane, yeah. Seth McFarlane brings to the screen his second film, A Million Day, A Million Ways to Die in the West. Uh, we have the animated uh, kids' film, Mr. Peabody and Sherman. We have a true story horror, well, not horror, but thriller drama sort of thing with Devil's Knots. A weird science fiction throwback film to the seventies, Space Station seventy six. Um, a weirder, even weirder film because of the performance in it of Nicolas Cage in Joe. Um, and then we have a few other small films rounding out with Afflicted, Fruitville Station and Leprechaun Origins. Yeah, Afflicted is actually the second vampire film of this week. Because it's a vampire oh. film. Shaky cam found footage vampire film, which is lovely. On top of that, we have TV Movie of the Week, the Blu-ray DVD Top 10, the UK Box Office Top 10 and some movie news. As usual, you can check out the website. Don't go over there to find out what was on this week's show because I completely forgot to put it up. I only remembered on Sunday, and that was way too late to actually put it up because I, I haven't been home that much over the last few days, so I completely forgot about that. But you can still make sure you check out the website, mondaymovieshow.co.uk. Um, you can get us on Facebook, facebook.com forward slash mondaymovieshow, and Twitter at mondaymovieshow, best place to actually give us your feedback is there. Yeah. I'm on Twitter at Cryptic Tadpole, Andrew's at EHDVD, and you can email us, mondaymovieshow at yahoo.com. I oh, very rarely check it. I was going to say as well on the on the uh, the Facebook page there's actually been a few trailers posted in the last couple of weeks because we've been able to get away that it will actually post trailers directly onto the site. So it means you can find us and you don't have to click anywhere. You can just actually watch the trailers in Facebook rather than going onto the website. Well, mm. if people want to have a look at that, but they want to they don't want to go all the way to the site, they can still have a look on there. There. The thing is, though, they're not on the site. Mm. That's true. So it would be nice if they were gone onto the site and then the link would actually go up on Facebook, but yeah, tomato, semantics. Tomato. And I'm not a dirty stoppy out of the cat. <laughs> I very rarely do it. I've lost my voice because of it, and it was an enjoyable night. Let's kick things off as we normally do then with some movie news. Uh, yeah, the only piece of news that I have is about Daniel Radcliffe, um, who is going to be 
uh, has now been cast is going to be a playing Michael Caine's son in the sequel to Now You See Me which is still currently titled Now You See Me 2 in not as some people are saying um, Now You Don't um, but it's going to have Michael Caine returning as well as a lot, the, the majority of the cast Mark Ruffalo Woody Harrelson Jesse Eisenberg Alza Fisher David Franco and Morgan Freeman all returning from the first film um, director um Louis, Louis Leterrier will not be returning though. Instead, it will be John M. Chu who will be directing it, and it's got a target date. They're expecting to have this done and filmed and released on 24th of June 2016. So they're giving themselves plenty of time. John M. Chu, what has he directed in the past? That name ring, doesn't he do G.I. Joe? Uh, maybe it is him. I, I think he's done. Has he not done a horror film? His name sounds like it's something for a horror film. John M. Chu. It must. It possibly is now. You know, you're saying that. I think it might be a GI Joe retaliation. So not the necessarily the best things, but but now you see me isn't an action film. So true. Um, but hmm, GI Joe. Gee, I'm just checking on IMDb, trying to stall a little bit to find out if it is. Yeah, John M. Chu did do GI Joe Retaliation. Mm. So hmm, I wasn't too overly keen with Now You See Me. It had a really good premise to it. But it just never followed through with it with its premise, and so unfortunately, I'm looking at some of the other stuff that John M. Chu's done, and he was worked on Justin Bieber's Never Say Never, Step yeah. Up Revolution, Step Up to the Streets. Well, the thing is, I I wasn't overly keen on that film at first. I saw Now You See Me, I was quite disappointed with it because of the whole thing of movie magic, and it's not really magic; it's the way it made its movie magic, not magic magic. Um, but over time, I've seen it a couple of times since then, and I've actually come to quite enjoy it a bit. Yeah, other films that John M. Chu's done is he's obsessed with dance movies. So Maybe he'll do a big dance musical magic in it. Yeah, well, we'll see. I just hope that it's a, it's better than the first one, because the first one, it, it had its, um, a decent premise to it. It just never followed through with it. But, but you know how there's many of those films that have this whole thing of a plot and twists and such... That you watch it, you go, yeah, okay, and you get to the end of it, and that's it. But then when you go back and watch them, you can go, because you know what's coming, you go, oh, no, that's, that doesn't make sense, that falls apart, and the plot as well. It actually kind of holds up. I haven't seen it twice, I've only seen it once, so I might give it a second watch, just to see if that's the case. Um, my news is uh, Leonardo DiCaprio's turned down the chance to play Steve Jobs in Danny Boyle's biopic of the Apple co-founder. The actor's reason behind the departure is down to him wanting to take a break from acting after he completes his work on Alexandro Gonzalez in order to The Revenant. Front runners to replace DiCaprio are Christian Bale, Matt Damon, Ben Affleck and Bradley Cooper. Now, I'm interested about this. Why don't they get... Um, what's his name? They had a, there, was a, there was a small film released. That I don't know if it's actually been released here or not. It was made in America with Aston Kutcher playing Steve Jobs. Why don't they have him cast in it? Because presumably they're playing Steve Jobs at, a different, at an older point in his life and not a whole biopic or something. Because Jobs is the film, as it's called. And it was him playing Steve Jobs when he set up his early, early career and stuff like that. So I wonder, I mean, if, if they're going to have that happen, tie it in. You know, get the same actor. The um, problem is, I think that one was done by Disney, and this one's getting done by a different company. So it would just be... Mm, I'm not sure about Ashton... It's an interesting li list, that one. Christian Bale, Matt Damon, Ben Affleck, Bradley Cooper. Who out yeah. of them four would you choose? Um, you know, I'd probably have to say um, Bradley Cooper. Because he's, he's doing... He's got this really good thing. He's really come out of doing TV stuff to go into film, and he's really got this screen presence. And this, this, because Steve Jobs had this presence that you ever saw him do any of his lives and any of the live presentations of stuff. He just had this thing that was, it was good on screen. And I mean, it's just the idea of the casting of this. Like I said, it's the whole thing of the. It's making me think back to. Um, because he's been cast already played by someone else in a film the same role this whole thing of that you had um, the films with oh, I can't think of his name now he's in Devil's Knot as well later on <laughs> Colin Firth with yeah. Colin Firth playing um, The King's Speech and then the same character is played in another film later on that same year by a different actor and you know it would have been great to have some continuity of the same actor because then people would have connected it and gone, oh, that's that person. 
It's it's not what they do though it, um, no, it in be, films. So it would be good to see that happen. I'd, I'd like to see that. You know, it has happened. I'm sure in somewhere they've taken a character and they had the same actor play them. So in different films, why not, yeah. Why not do it though with people that were real historical characters? You know, have the same actor play them in a couple of things so that they can then, when people see it, people will get you'll get that automatic connection with people that know the earlier version of the film. Yeah, but it, it's down to the fact that it, it's a different take on the film, and so it'll be slightly strange. It, it it will be like seeing a sequel to the film like you've originally seen, but it's exactly the same story. So they might not give that actor sort of like the leeway that they would have if if it was two different actors playing it. It's a it's a weird thing anyway. Um, more news. This is I don't know why this is happening, but this. Dwayne Johnson has confirmed that he will star in the big screen version of Beer Watch. The actor took to Instagram and said, This is my beach, bitch. Rumours are true. We're making Beer Watch the movie. Edgy, raunchy and hopefully funny as hell. Cue slow-mo running on the beach. Hashtag who needs mouth to mouth. Hashtag red shorts be hugging a brother. Okay, so is this going to be a serious thing or is it going to be a um, comedy thing? Because... I really don't care for either, to be honest. And I can see them doing it, turning it into a whole thing. It's like, oh yeah, there's people doing drug dealing on the beach, you know, by boats at night or something. And you know, it's going to be one of those kind of things. You just know it's going to be like that. The only, thing, the, only the only way it could possibly be worse is if they had cast Ben Stiller in the role. Probably, yeah. No, he did say edgy, raunchy, and very funny. Mm, yeah. The Rock doing comedy. We know how that's turned out before. Unfortunately, I didn't have to see it. Yeah, I know. Um, Don Mancini, the creator of creator of Chucky. Oh no, won- I have seen it. Oh dear, no. What? I saw Tooth Fairy. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, at least it's not as bad as Vin, Di- as Vin Diesel in the Pacifier. Oh, don't remind me. Okay, let's Too move on to one. <laughs> yeah, Don Mancini, the creator of Chucky, one day would like the Psycho Doll to team up with Annabelle from the self-titled spin-off and The Conjuring. Mancini said, I'm hoping that at some point, some future point, we have Annabelle and Chucky team up. The only problem, though, is that Annabelle and Chucky belong to two completely different studios. And we know what happens when um, two horror icons from different franchises and different studios try to clash. They get a film of their own? No, they get Freddy versus Jason and how much of a nightmare it was to try and get that film together. So it, but it does happen. It does, yeah. It definitely does happen. Look at in the past with um, this is not horror related, but Who Framed Roger Rabbit? When they got mm. Warner and Disney to work together with uh, the Looney Tune stuff and Disney characters, that was a rare thing. But it can happen. It'll probably take a long time, and it all just depends on how Annabelle does at the worldwide box office. I know it's gone in at number two at the U- uh, US box office, and it's out over here um, on Friday. It just all depends on how much people latch on to the character of Annabelle because she was a minor character in The Conjuring. Um, she was only touched upon in that and they said they're going to make a spin-off from it. And from what I've heard, her character is sort of like secondary in the film uh, belonging to her name. And that can't be the case because if you look at the Child's Play films, Chucky is the central character in the film. Mm. Well, Whereas well, by the sense well, of things... He's well, not, he's, but, not the, he's not the main character in the first one. He's the toy in the first one. He, he's, he's still sort of like the main evil. Whereas even in this, in Annabelle, supposedly she takes a backseat to all the the weird, strange bumps in the night kind of scares that you normally associate with these kind of films. So you can't do that with your leading bad guy in a film. If you've got two bad guys teaming up together, then it just means that Chucky is going to absolutely obliterate Annabelle. It would be interesting to see the two of them together if they do manage to make up a deal, because then they'd have to see as well whether Chucky would work for just peanuts or he'd actually want to be paid. Yeah, well, maybe he's extra plastic for himself. He'd get given a credit card. Uh, final piece of news the is Chucky cards. You imagine you have yeah. to do any any you know those websites you can go to and you can put any picture on a card and then get it sent to you and done that way. Imagine someone getting a, a Chucky card made. That <laughs> would be brilliant. Well, I'm going to get a Chucky tattoo, so... <laughs> yeah. 
Are you going to make the mouse start moves and go, Hi, I'm Jackie, and, I, and I, I'm your friend to the end. Hi, ho. Ha, ha, ha. I, I don't think they're allowed sort of like little speaker implants in your skin, because <laughs> that would be really weird, that Dad. That would be the next thing, yeah, talking tattoos. Yeah, brilliant. Uh, final piece of news is, according to Trek Movies, Roberto Orsi will be the director of the next Star Trek movie. Joining him will be cinematographer Claudio Miranda, who plans to shoot the film entirely on digital and not 35mm, the format used by J.J. Abrams of the previous two films. Miranda's previous works includes Life of Pi, Curious Case of Benjamin Button, and Tron Legacy. The film is set to start shooting next February for a 2016 release. Okay, there's one advantage to them doing that fully digital, which is the fact that you don't have the, the time it takes to transfer from film, because it has to be done... It has to basically be transferred from film to digital so they can then do special effects on it. Um, but the thing I have about this is that Roberto Orsi, I don't think he's actually directed anything before. For him to do Star Trek as like his first big major acting, uh, acting uh, directing role, um, I don't know that's a great idea, to be honest. I know he's done a lot of stuff, he's produced things, but I don't know, I'm not sure he's actually directed anything. Um, two things. Nothing, actually. He's attached to Star Trek 3 and Ice Age 5. Yeah. And Ice Age 5 is completely CG, so it doesn't involve any actual directing of camera work. It's just directing CGI work. So that's more... That's not a thing of her directing people on, you know, in front of a camera and stuff and directing camera movements and sets and organising all that. So I think this is... I mean, it could be absolutely brilliant. I have nothing against someone doing that, but... Personally, I, if I mean, if I was doing something my first directing job, I would not want it to be something the size and the pressure of Star Trek. Sort of like uh, Wally Fister going from being the cinematographer on on all the Dark Knight movies and Christopher well, Nolan films, and then doing Transcendence. Well, no, I disagree. I don't have a problem with that because I mean, if you look at Transcendence, it is well shot. It's not necessarily well directed and it's well edited, but he does have an idea of what he wants to do. And he knows how. He yeah, knows but the how, thing he knows how things in front of the camera work. And yeah, but the thing is, well. though, he wasn't just the cinematographer on the film. He was the director know, on the film as well. Yeah. I was saying that, Whereas but, but in, there's, a, there's a thing between being able to get, get what you want from your cast and such, which I think he managed... I think he, he got good performances from people in Transcendence. I just think it was not a, not a script that was fully up to it and that it, was, it wasn't overall together worked. But you need someone who can get what they need from the actors and everything in front of them. And... Can Roberto also do that? I don't know because I haven't seen him direct anything he, else before. He might be able to with him working on previous Star Trek films, etc. And uh, the, the big picture here is the fact that Claudio Miranda, um, he's a known person who works with digital brilliantly. You look at The Life of Pi, and that's a beautiful film to look at. Um, you look at even, I, I'm not much of a fan of Tron Legacy. And even though there are there are scenes in Tron Legacy which are a bit miss when it comes to some of the cinematography, etc. But, but he still managed to get some absolute brilliant shots out of it. And I'm hoping that also he doesn't do the Abrams thing and just fill the film with lens flare as well. If he mm. does, if, if he cuts the lens flare down by a good 60, 70 percent, I think it'll be a brilliant film in that case, because then at least you'll be able to see it. I think that'll be down partly to whoever he hires as cinematographer. So that'll be which is see. which is Claudio Miranda who's who, going to be the cinematographer who did the other Star Trek film so we'll, we'll probably still get some but they did note and dial it down a lot in the second film actually I think he dialed it up a bit but Claudio Miranda <laughs> is the one who did um, Life of Pi and so I think that's going to give him the benefit of the doubt and it starts shooting next year so 2016 is the anniversary of it so they did want to fast track it a little bit yeah, right. don't fast track it with a don't fast track it with a first director, first time director. That will just end up in disaster and reshoots, which will cost more. Every director has had to start somewhere with a big film. Um, UK box office top ten time. We'll quickly go through this because we it's the same box office as we did in last week's show. But a number ten is sex tape, which is um, nowhere near as exciting as watching a real sex tape. Okay, let's quickly move on to number nine, the Riot Club. That's disgusting. We haven't we haven't seen this. Um, not had a chance to see it. I do want to see it, but everything you hear about it is the fact of that it's all about these characters who are they're all you know sport little rich kids at at college or university, and things go wrong, and then they try and cover it up. And it's this little social club thing, which is basically full of characters you don't like and don't care about. So it's it's got a problem whereby there's no 
um, connection with the characters, as far as I'm aware. But still haven't seen it, so I can't say for definite how I thought of it. We'll probably get to that on DVD when it comes out. At number eight is Guardians of the Galaxy. Which is fantastic. One of the best films of the year. Um, and surprisingly so for a big film like this. And as fun, funny, amazing, enjoyable. I've seen it now seven times, I think it is. Christ. Yeah. yeah. And I've loved it each time. Last time was because I went to see something else, didn't couldn't see it. So I was at the cinema. Of all the things on, you know, this was the one I went to again because everything else was not as good as that. Seven times in the cinema. I think so, yeah. So. Ouch. And, and surprisingly, I'm going to be buying it on day one release on Blu-ray. I, so, yeah, I have as well. I pre-ordered it as well. And, and the thing is, you know what? I'm one of my friends who hasn't seen it yet. If he wants to go and see it, I said, I will go and see it with him at the cinema. Yeah, but me buying a superhero movie on day one launch. <laughs> that it it's must not, be good then. It's not really a superhero movie. It's just a, it's it's just still, a comic movie. It still belongs in the comic book ilk, and I, I don't buy those kind of films at all. Mm. So it, it must be good. At number seven is Lucy. Which is above average for the typical Luke Besson kind of thing you do but he kind of loses it towards the end I think it's a very very intelligent science fiction film but it's it, it doesn't know that it's intelligent so it can't really work on that properly and bring it through properly I do like it but I think the ending is very kind of eh what huh head scratching definitely yes at number six is Pride which is a brilliant British film, um, really good drama based on the true story of the, the gays supporting the minors. Um, and it's fantastically put together, great cast and really enjoyable and a lot more funnier and, and brilliant than I was ever expecting it to be. At number five is A Walk Among the Tombstones. Which I liked, considering there's been some very harsh reviews, I think, of it. Um, and I didn't think it was brilliant. I, I do think it's very rough around the edges. It does show that it's being directed by someone who hasn't had a lot of experience directing. I think the director had only directed a small film before this and then something on TV. Um, so this was his first big film. It's okay for that was, but the, the thing that's really, I think, have been against it is the fact that it's Liam Neeson playing the similar kind of type he's been playing for the last three or four films, um, which doesn't help because everyone brings that to it. I think if it had been another actor, there wouldn't be that so much hatred for it. I, I do think it is a little bit procedurally plodding, but I do like that it's, it's a very grim and dark film. And I just think... I didn't like it, to be honest. It, it's not down to the fact that I'm slightly annoyed with Liam Neeson and the roles that he's choosing. He, he needs to be branch out a little bit more than what he's doing. But if actors are comfortable in the roles that they keep playing, then fine. It, it's OK if they, if they can try something different with each of the role. And with this one... He tries to do something a little bit different, sort of like when Nicolas Cage was in movies like 8mm. He's trying to do a little bit like that, and that's the that's what the film had the feel of to me. It felt it like does, more yes. like 8mm, but the problem with the movie is it's pacing. It, you need to, with a, with a thriller like this, I, I need to be on the edge of my seat. I need to feel a bit uncomfortable slightly. And it just tries to be grisly for grisly's sake. And the piercing is just way too lackadaisical. It's very mundane. It's not interesting enough. At number four is a new went before what we did on our holiday. Which is, I, I'm not really sure whether to say, if I, I can't decide if it's better than Pride or Pride is better, but it's another British film which is really, really good. Um, the one thing I would say is, is that it's hilariously funny because of the kids mostly. But um, then it makes a, it has a sort of a turn her way through it and becomes this other type of film, which is where it does kind of lose itself a bit. But it's still fairly consistently funny from then onwards as well. And it's brilliant to see a, a film that's kind of has this raw sort of comedy to it without being, um, you know, going into gross out humour and relying on toilet humour and things like that. And number three is The Box Trolls. Which is a brilliant animation film, um, one of the rare live, not, not live action, the rare, the rare um, stop motion animations. Um, and it's, um, I think, I think, I still think I like Paranorman better, but I think this is more consistent all the way throughout that it's just funnier and nice little sort of moments in it, which genuinely just made me smile and crack up, um, as well as having a brilliant end credit sequence, which you should stay in the whole film for. Yeah, and it's what I applaud Laika for is, by the looks of things, this is their third film. 
they're not an animation company that's decided to steer, stray away from um, like the darkness of their films. They could have played it much more safe and added more colour and brightness to the movie and made it more child-friendly, whereas, uh, but they haven't done that. They've looked at their previous two films in Paranormal and Coraline, and they have a very horror tinge to it, and they're not scared by following that ethos, and well done to them for doing that. Yeah. Having said that, though, this is the least horror Story. It's it is darkly done visually dark but story dark is not as dark as the previous films apart from the the main bad guy who who reminded me of the child catcher from chitty chitty bang bang yeah. it's very like, like twisted did you realize that that was ben kingsley because i did not no which is the scary thing but <laughs> I, I liked really liked the bad guy because he was really malevolent and twisted and that's what's missing from a lot a lot of these kids animated films Something like that. Mm. And number two is the new entry for the Equalizer. Talking of bitter and twisted, um, I really did what, not... What, you are? No, this film. I really <laughs> just... I'm not a fan of this film. I was really disappointed with it. I was really let down by the fact that I know the TV series, I grew up with it, and I wanted more from this. There's, there's really nothing of the character from the TV series in this film. Um, and I know it's saying that it's, you know, it's not the same actor, obviously, Edward Woodward has passed away, but they could have done something to actually be faithful to the source material they've not they've basically gone here's the character's name that's all we're keeping throw everything out and it's just it's it's a waste it could have easily been just another denzel washington um revenge movie and had him called something else and you would not have thought oh this is the equalizer you would have just thought oh it's a denzel washington revenge flick and, and that's what i think is really terrible about it it's not the equalizer it's something else and even then I thought it was very slow paced. I don't think anything much happens. I don't much like the main character. You have a main character who basically turns out to be a serial killer. And you're supposed to like him. And I just didn't care for him at all. And at number one, it's a new entry for a very strange new entry for Billy Elliot the Musical Live. Yeah, which I was supposed to go and see, but we didn't end up going to see in the end. Um, but, I mean, it's done that well because apparently it had sold out performances everywhere, just about. And. It seems to be the musical that everyone wants to see. So if it's doing this well at the box office and the cinema of the live showings, just imagine how well it must be doing at the real live showings. I really actually want to go to the cinema to see like a, a, a live show like this because I've never been. And you have, haven't you? I've seen a few. I've seen... Well, I've seen one. I saw one that was just a drama. It wasn't a musical. And I really did enjoy it. I can't remember what it was called now. Um... um I want to say simple lives, but it's not. It's something, something lives. I can't remember what it is. But um, then I've seen, uh, I can't think of the name of that one, but a musical one as well. And I didn't so much enjoy the musical one as I did the live one, the the the, the drama one. Um, and I was kind of looking forward to the Billy Elliot one as much as I don't think I like it because I'm not a massive fan of musicals. I was curious about it. Yeah, the same. Um, supposedly Frankenstein. Uh, the yes. one with Benedict Cumberbatch as the creature, and then yeah. uh, John somebody Lee, John else. Lee Miller. John Lee Miller. Yeah. Benedict, Benedict Cumberbatch and John Lee Miller, which the thing is that they played on different nights. One of them played the monster, one of them played Frankenstein, and then they swapped it around and they and they they swapped roles. And depending on which show you go to, that it does you do know ahead of time. It tells you which one it is. They're actually showing both versions when they showed them at the cinema, and there are encore performances of those in the next month, I think, in November. Towards the end of end of October, beginning of November, both of those are being shown on separate nights, just a one-off or a couple of couple of showings per night. So if you are looking into that, then have a look at it because I'm supposed to be saying I think we've got plans to go and see that one. That tickets booked for that one, um, for one of them, um, and I I'm looking forward to that because obviously it's Benedict Cumberbatch, and supposedly John Lee Miller is really good in it as well. It's, it's yeah, interesting to see as well the two Sherlock's. Yeah, my, my cinema is showing both. Um, Thursday the 30th of October is the Benedict Cumberbatch one, mm -hmm. and Monday the 3rd of November is the Johnny Lee Miller one. So yeah. I'm, I'm in, if I go to the cinema to see something like that, it's definitely Frankenstein, which would really interest me. So I might actually have to think about um, sort of like ditching following the nerd on that Thursday night and going to see that. So. I kind of, I, I, want, I would love to go and try and see both of them just to see the different approaches that the actors have to the roles. Yep. Okay, let's get on to our first review of the week. It's Dracula and Told. It's Certificate 15. Now, from now on, I'm actually going to add the certificate beside it 
before I review a film, I'm going to see what certificate it is, just so people know. Mm. And um, yeah, it's a, it's a 15, and it's directed by Gary Shaw. That's a 15 in the UK, by the way. Um, it stars Luke Evans, who plays Vlad, or Vlad uh, Tepes, or Vlad the Impaler, depending on the way you look at it. And as a young boy, um, he was taken from his parents. His his father, who is who is the king of his of his people, gave him up to the Turkish army when they requested one thousand of their boys to join the Turkish army. And he garnered the name of Vlad the Impaler, where he would scare everybody once he grew up. By impaling them, he would leave their bodies hanging on huge, massive stakes from the ground. Just their bodies just construed on these stakes, and it would really scare him. During his later life, however, he became more of a, a recluse character, a more character where he was in the shadows more so because he wanted to look after his people. His people, he wanted his people to be safe, and so they're housed up in um, Castle Dracula, practically, in a huge, massive, walled off uh, castle area, and they live in a prosperous life. That is until Dominic Cooper's character, who plays King Mohammed, or Mehmed, um, he decides to want to follow in the footsteps and the fact that he wants to recruit a thousand boys from Vlad's, uh, um, Vlad's people to join the Turkish army in their fight. However, Vlad, he needs to come up with a decision whether to do this, and he ultimately says no, which angers King Mohammed, and so he attacks his people. Now, Vlad, he ultimately wants some way of being able to protect it, and he hears stories of a dark creature that houses itself inside of a cave on top of a huge, massive cliff not far from where his people live, and so he goes up there and he makes a deal with this dark creature and that, the fact that He gets vampiric powers, and so if he can manage to sustain it for three days without giving in to the bloodlust, he will go back to his human state. However, if he ends off relenting to the bloodlust, he will become a vampire. Here's a clip. What's happening to you? (laughs) No, stop it! (laughs) We can't strike down whoever did this to you. I chose this. This is the strength you sought? (laughs) But why? Because I sent corpses back to Mehmet. Instead of our son. You did this for us. In two days I'll be restored. I just have to resist. Resist what? Resist what, Vlad? Tell me. A thirst. For blood. And so Vlad has these powers to protect his people from, from the king, and that, that's, his, that's his quest. He needs to actually protect his people. Now, the thing with Dracula Untold is it could have fell into multiple different categories when it comes to these these vampire films. It could have uh, fallen easily into being as cheesy as the Underworld series later on in the series. It could have fell into the Van Helsing category. It could have even gone as far as Bram Stoker's Dracula. To be honest, it falls somewhere in between all of that. It, it's, it takes itself seriously. It doesn't um, fall back to being sarcastic or very cartoony or comic book. There is one character in the movie, the sort of like ego-esque character, who, who adds the tiny tinge of lightness to the, the film, the tiny tinge of cartoony to the film. But that's about it. The film itself is a, is a much more serious movie. And there were times in the movie I was thinking, don't you dare fall into sort of like the mummy category which involves like a scene in the mummy where the, where Arlen Vosloff's character he, he brings up a huge massive wave and it's got his face in it there's a scene in this movie where Vlad has um, managed to get together tons, thousands and thousands of bats and they're about to swarm down and he smacks his fist off the ground and I was saying to myself don't you dare take the shape of a fist and it doesn't do that which is a good thing because it, it keeps mm. to the darkness what I, I like about the film is that even though there's very little blood in it, surprisingly, for a vampire film and for a, it's not overly violent. It doesn't rely on CGI blood. 
it, it, when you do see the tinges of blood in the film, it looks proper natural. And so I applaud the director for doing that because he could have easily gone and just said, oh, we're going to lob off limbs here and there. There's going to be lots of necks being ripped open and we're going to have tons of CGI blood. That that takes me out of a horror film rather than actually putting me into it. It's not a perfect film and it's not a very good film. It's an enjoyable film. It, it never... F- at times it does feel like it's stretching its running time because the story itself is very simplistic but it's only on for 90 or few 90 odd minutes and at least it didn't try to be overly too long and go into the two hour mark and so i give it a pat on the back for that it, it's it's a watchable film it could have been much worse than what it turned out to be i i mean i i have to say i i agree with what you're saying there about it i do think it does have that kind of supernatural look that links it with things like um underworld films and the mummy um and there definitely is that thing like you're saying about the the bats and the whole thing of it being like a fist when it goes down and i like it and i enjoyed it but it is it does have moments in it that are quite cringeworthy that you're kind of sitting there going oh really you're doing that but you can overlook that and go with it. It is, it is essentially, except for the the casting of Charles Dance as the as the original vampire creature that he finds in the cave. It's kind of like a B movie, and it's a B list cast, um, and it works on that effect. If it had anyone big in it, I don't know that it would work. If it had, if it had been anyone bigger than Luke Evans playing Dracula in the film, playing um, Vlad in the film, I think it might not have actually worked. So I think it was kind of, it was clever casting because I don't think he was original, he was the original choice. Um, and it, I have to say, I mean, I'm surprised how much I did enjoy it and I'm looking forward to the next one I do because this is going to be the whole thing of the, basically going to be the Avengers done as a monster movies thing with the mummy, uh, the werewolf, uh, the wolfman, sorry, and um, things like Frankenstein's monster. So, I, I'm looking forward to see what they do next, but, you know, it could still all fall over. What's interesting, Nora, is they could have gone to a 12-year and yeah. made it sort of feel like the Avengers, but by the looks of things, they're realising that the iconic characters that they have got, which is Dracula, uh, the mummy, Frankenstein's monster, um, are more darker. And so we need to aim it at the sort of like the 15 audience plus rather than aim it at the 12 year market. They could have easily done that. And so, again, they need a bit of appraisal for doing that. The fact that yeah. they, they did think, oh, we need to make it a little bit more adulty. Yeah. But then the thing is, then again, they didn't really push it adulty as they could have. There's, it's sort of like it's it, it it's lacking, sort of like dip- it is lacking in some areas for that, I think. It's dipping their toes in the water. It's exactly the same way as Marvel did it with the first Iron Man movie, even though the the first Iron Man movie is actually a really good starting block to start off the Avengers. Unfortunately, after that, the rest of the films leading up to Avengers Assemble was was very lacking. But um, I'm hoping that's not going to be the case with this one and they realise they can build up to something special. The only problem I'm going to have is how are they going to meld them all together? To make yeah. an Avengers style film, that's the part I'm scary, scared at. The thing I didn't like about Dracula and Tall Door was Dominic Cooper. I thought his character it's just. Pointless, wasted. It, it, it just, yeah, it just felt very, very cheesy. That's the major cheese of the film itself. He's, his accent is really bad. And he even, even has a little moment where he's talking to his people and sort of like building them, them up a little bit. And you're just thinking to yourself, just stop. Why did you even have to speak? <laughs> So it's it's better than I thought it would be. Yeah. Uh, going on to the next movie, which is Gone Girl, which is directed by David Fincher. Um, it's based on a novel by, I don't know if it's Gillian or Gillian Flynn. I think it's Gillian Flynn. Um, but who also, she also wrote the screenplay for the film. Um, in the movie, you have Ben Affleck playing Nick Dunn, who is a guy who lives with his wife, um, Amy, played by Ros- Rosamund Pike. At the start of the film, we're introduced to him. Things seem to be going sort of okay. It's the anniversary of his and his wife' uh, marriage. Um, things don't necessarily seem to be as great as they could be, but everything's okay until he turns. He turns up home, finds a scene there with a, a smashed glass table, um, and no sign of where she is. Unable to find Amy, he calls the police, who come out to investigate um, and begin begin asking him questions and asking him things that are going on. 
all the things sort of then become a bit more blown up when um, there is it becomes apparent that the press are all there and everything and it's the whole thing of it's Amy's disappearance being sort of questioned as to how their relationship was going how their marriage was going um, and all these things going on and then obviously then the, the detective played by Kim Dickens turns around and begins to question him about things looking at him possibly as whether or not Nick may have killed and disposed of his wife's body here's a clip so you got to the bar around 11 today. Where were you before that, just to cross that off? Well, I was home. I left at 9.30, got a cup of coffee, newspaper. I went to Sawyer Beach and read the news. Did you visit with anyone there? Well, I mean, I kind of go to Sawyer Beach for the solitude. So your wife has no friends here. Is she kind of standoffish, Ivy League, rubs people the wrong way? She's from New York. She's complicated. She's got very high standards. Type A. Well, that can make you crazy if you're not like that. You seem pretty laid back. Type B. Speaking of which, Amy's blood type. God, I don't know. I have to look it up at the house. You don't know if she has friends. You don't know what she does all day. And you don't know your wife's blood type. Sure y'all are married. I, I Maybe it's type O. Where are her folks? New York? Yeah. Can they get here in time for this press conference tomorrow? Tomorrow? I, I have no idea. I haven't talked to them. You haven't called your wife's parents I yet? I mean, you can't get a signal in this building. I've been in here talking to you. Well, call them, please, Nick, now. Fine. Should I know my wife's blood type? So... The thing with it is, I mean, I'm I am going to be biased because of the fact that I am a big David Fincher fan. I do love his films. I I will say this though, I'm not entirely biased enough to say that when he does a bad film, he does a bad film. Um, and a case in point is the the Curious Case of Benjamin Button, which I really did not like. Um, but all his other films, I've either liked or really enjoyed. And this is one of the ones that I really enjoyed. It's fantastically directed. It's solidly it's continuously all the way through there's tension and there's build up and the characters even the scenes that aren't tense there's still tension there because of the fact that there's things going on that you're not aware of the weirdness the weird thing about it is I've not read the book my other half has read the book and she really really loved the film because of the fact that it was so um, faithful to the book um, now I've not read it so I don't know that I don't have that now the thing I will say about it is that I have issues with the story and the storytelling because it's a film that jumped around on its time frame. It has things happen, then it jumps to a certain day, then it has other things, and then it jumps it jumps back, way, way back, and tells you things another way. And I don't have a problem with it doing that. I have a problem with the way that it's done in the, basically the film is two and a half hours long, and it has twists and turns, things that come up. And I was really kind of annoyed that I don't think it was an hour and a half in and I already knew a lot of things that I thought should have been held back a lot later. I, it, it tips its hand, I think, storytelling-wise, a lot earlier than it should. But that doesn't mean that it actually gets boring or anything. It doesn't because the, the, the twists and turns are kind of like, oh, wow, blimey, you know, wasn't expecting that. Really kind of shocked at a couple of moments. It is rated 18 for particular some graphic violence sequences in it and strong language in it um, and it's a thing of that it's it's got fantastic performance in it Ben Affleck is really good in it Rosamund Pike is absolutely fantastic in it you have Neil Patrick Harris turns up in a smaller role who's perfectly fine in it Tyler Perry is very good in it and I'm not a fan of Tyler Perry because um, the only film I've seen him in was the um, the last Alex Cross film which was not a very good film um, and Kim Dickens is, is perfectly fine as well. You've also got in there Carrie Coon who plays um, Nick's, Nick's sister who is there and um, there's all these things going on between that sort of Nick is figuring out these things and discussing them with his sister. So I don't know how much she's there in the book but she's there kind of as a, more of a sounding board for him talking out ideas and talking out things and explaining things which you do need for the audience otherwise there's no way for them to get inside Nick's head. Um, so I think it's really well done, really well directed, really well storytelling, but I have issues with it because of the fact that it's it, the way it jumps around too early in the film, for, that it, it kind of gave away, I think, too much early on. It, it's a lot more like things like Zodiac that he's done um, and The Social Network in that it focuses on the drama and the characters and the people. It's not a fantastical thing like Fight Club or Panic Room. It's not a big visual style like that. But it's kind of more, it is more his, um, more like his recent films, Girl with a Dragon Tattoo as well, which I really liked, even though a lot of people didn't. 
it's, it's the same visual style but it's very subdued and it's more about what's going on in the scene the people than oh look at that isn't that amazing yeah for me yeah um, my biggest problem with the film itself i i really like the film my biggest problem with the film itself is exactly the same problem as i had with the girl with the dragon tattoo is the fact that fincher does not know when to end it the film, I bel- uh, the, the film itself is on for two and a half hours, and um, when you get into the last third, we're not going to mention anything to do with the last third, but Good. it seems to be in the last, I would say, 15 minutes of the last third, it has that problem of the girl with the dragon tattoo. You expect a point in the movie where it ends, and then Fincher has another 15, 20 minutes to go. And I just felt like it overstretched its ending way too much, and... That was, in my opinion, the biggest problem with the girl with the dragon tattoo. And there are parts in the film itself, again, not giving much away, which harkens to movies. There's one scene which is very akin to a scene in Hostel, which is very strange to see in a David Fincher film. It just, I don't know it, exactly what scene you're talking about, and I know which scene you're talking about in Hostel. Is it not Hostel 2, more precisely? It's Hostel, yeah, Hostel Part 2. Yeah. So, it, yeah, there, there's an exact... It, it feels... It, it's not like a carbon copy scene, but it, it feels like it has ties in with that he, it, that he got an idea from Eli Roth and thought, I'm going to do that in this film, just to add a bit of interest to the film, just to add a different kind of tone and feel. And the film itself, it switches tones a lot in the film. You, you expected by the trailer. The trailer is stupidly deceiving because you think the film is a very straightforward forward drama thriller, but Fincher throws in a ton of curveballs by adding really dark humour, which reminds you a lot of the Coen's films, uh, films like Fargo, where it has, like, there are supposedly very serious films, but it has an undercurrent of really malevolent dark humour to it, and that, that, that um, this does have that same, and I quite like that at times because it alleviates the tension. It's a, Like I said, it's a very good film. I just wish it ended about 20 minutes before it did. I, I didn't I didn't have that I get what you're saying about that and Girl with the Dragon Tattoo I didn't get it as much with this as I did with Girl with the Dragon Tattoo but I still like them both yeah I think it I think they're very much similar in the in take with that and Fincher when when Fincher actually wants to hit you across the face with something heavy in a film he it makes sure you back. definitely see it <laughs> he it, does it, not hold back no it's <laughs> like he's just ripped the hands off the Hulk and smacked you across the face with them because uh, he's got such a powerhouse with that. A prime example, even though a lot of people hate Alien 3, he had the balls to kill Ripley. So I, three. I do. I like Alien 3, and it's not his fault that the film is that bad. It's the studio's fault. But at least he actually killed an iconic character in Ripley. <laughs> Ripley yeah, she comes back in Alien Resurrection as a sort of like an android kind of thing. But yeah, at least he managed to do that. And I doubt very few act- directors would do that. Completely opposite in torn film. Yeah. Next up is Dolphin Tale 2. It's directed by Charles Martin Smith. And it, it follows on from uh, Dolphin Tale. It's set um, a couple of years after Dolphin Tale. Should, and we, should we just... You should, I, should, I don't know if you should really just go over quickly and say what happened in Dolphin Tale. So I've not seen the first one. Have you not seen the first one? I've not seen the I first Dolphin Tale. I thought you'd seen the first one. No, I have not okay. seen it. Do you want me to go over that quickly then, first? Yeah, if you want. Okay, well, because in Dolphin Tell, which is based on a true story, as Dolphin Tell 2 is apparently as well, um, it was to do with this uh, marine park that finds a dolphin which has um, been injured, caught in a fishing net, its tail is cut in the fishing net and they have to amputate it. So because of that, the dolphin can't swim because it can't wag a tail, it doesn't have a tail anymore. And the, the film was all about how... The dolphin, first of all, started learning to, to swim by tagging, wagging its tail differently, sideways instead of up and down. But that was causing problems, apparently. So then they had to find a way of creating a um, you know limb replacement, to, of putting a... Um, what's it called again? You know, when you make a... a prosthetic. A for someone. A prosthetic, yeah. But them creating a prosthetic with the character played by Morgan Freeman, who was a guy who made prosthetics and all this whole thing about how they did that and created that and raised money and everything. And it was one of these kind of typical Disney films, feel-good films because of that. Yeah, and this one follows directly on from that, the fact that it is all about Winter and the Dolphin, which Andrew was just described there. Um, she's in the the sort of like the facility where they look after the Dolphins. It's run by Harry Connick Jr.'s character who plays 
Dr. Claire Haskett and um, it, it seems to be able to actually get on with its life uh, winter uh, because they need a keeper there rather than what they normally do they bring a, um, a animal back to its uh, normal ways and then let it go there's a scene in the film which involves a turtle which they, they let it go after it's getting its, its proper health back they can't do that with their winter because the fact that it has got a prosthetic tail and um, a lot of dolphins out in the wild will not be able to latch onto it and ultimately in the end kill winter now, the, the place itself is under inspection, and unfortunately, um, they're told they've only got 30 days to find Winter, another partner, because the partner which who Winter was with passes away. And so they're only given 30 days to try and find a new partner. Um, here's a clip. What are you doing? This has gone on long enough. the new house. Yeah, like 10 minutes. You know what I mean? Don't be so pushy. And so the film itself, I have not seen the first one because that was the reason why Andrew went over it. And it, he said it was a typical Disney film where it, it, it doesn't try to be offensive at all. Um, mm. It doesn't try to be brave, but it, 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 it feels like one of those... When it's cold outside and you walk into a nice warm room, that that's how it, um, I'm Garner and what his feelings of uh, the first one's like. And that's exactly the same with the second one. It doesn't try to go off um, in a completely different direction. It steers on exactly the same path um, that the first one sets out to be. This this film, it even though it feels like a movie that's made for the small screen, made for a family sitting around... Um, their, their TV screens in a nice, comfortable, warm room on a winter's day to enjoy a family-friendly film. Now, a lot of people might seem that deem that as a bad thing, and that's not the case, though, with Dolphin Tale 2, because it's completely inoffensive. It, it really is. It, it, it is a nice, relaxing film, and it's nice to see a movie every now and again at the cinema that's a relaxing film rather than something that's completely hectic or something that should not be what it, it, it sets out to be. And I, I know a lot of people might be put off with that because the cinema is supposed to be escapism. It's supposed to take you out of real life and um, for like an hour and a half, two hours and show you something that you don't normally see. And at times, I like to see a film where it is just a very safe movie where your mind doesn't have to think about loads of different plot points. Your mind can actually relax and that's what Dolphin Tale 2 is. It reminded me a lot of watching the small little Australian film, Red Dog. It's not up there with Red Dog because I absolutely love Red Dog. Red Dog's a very underrated little um, Australian movie about a dog that um, sort of like takes over a community anyway, takes over the hearts of a community. This is sort of the same with Dolphin Tale 2 because of winter. It's taken over the hearts of everybody in the in the place itself and they they want to look after wind and make sure that um, it's very safe. And so it's enjoyable. And I actually quite liked it. I surprisingly liked it. Okay. And I think it's rated PG as well, isn't it? It's a U. It's a U. Okay. Yes. The first one I think was a PG. Um, okay. So uh, shall I do draft day? Mm -hmm. uh, which is a 15. Um, and this is the other thing as well. I've just been looking into it because I do remember it's actually been released in cinemas, but also um, was released on Friday the same day for download on certain places. I know it was on YouTube as a paid download as well option. Um, it's directed by Ivan Reitman. Um, it is a movie about the sport of American football. Now, I'm going to explain a quick thing about it because you don't have to know, but it helps to know. Um, draft day is a thing in America. It's a big thing to do with American football where... After there have been all the people that are in college playing football, um, playing American football, they then get, you know, who's the best of the best and they all get listed up. And then the best of the best are, are then put into this thing where all of the, the different um, 
teams, the different stadiums all over the different states of America um, will go through and they have picks basically of who they want, who they who they want first, who they want second, who they want third and stuff. And it goes by order of each team then gets a pick and basically there will be one team that is the first team, one team that's in the second team, third team, fourth team and so on. We'll have each, each of them will have these slots in which are basically they're given 10 minutes each to say which player they want and then they've got that player and they, they are, you know, the first come, first served gets them. If they pick your player you want and you're the next team, that's, that's you out of that, you've got to pick someone else. Um, and this is all about the fact that you can trade those, they can make deals, they can trade picks, they can trade their places and stuff so they can move each other around and stuff and make deals for that. This is all about a character played by Kevin Costner, who is one of the managers of a team. He's a manager of the, the Browns, um, the Cleveland Browns, I think it is. Um, I'm not sure exactly, I think I'm wrong there, but I'll go over that. Um, but he is basically um, the manager of a team who does all these wheeling and dealings and sorting out things and getting things organized so that they can then work out who they want and they can try and get the best team they can. They've not been successful for so many years. They're trying to put together a really good team with what they've got. Um, well, meanwhile, at the same time, he's having relationship problems with a character played by Jennifer Garner, who is his girlfriend at the start of the film. She tells him that, um, and he learns that she's pregnant and they're going to have a kid, even though they've not made their relationship obvious and, and explained to everyone else. It's completely secret between them. Um, all this is all going on on draft day. It's sort of the 12 hours leading up to that happening. Um, and he makes a kind of what's considered a crucial mistake where he trades away lots, lot, they're basically the next three year first picks to another team so that he can try and get something big going and, and basically get them into the top, the first place on the pick list. Here's a clip. Sonny, I'd like to congratulate you. I asked you to make a splash and you did. Is everybody still there? Anthony, how do you already know about this? What can I tell you, my boy? It's good to be the owner. I'm about to board my plane. I'm heading for New York. You're going to the draft? No, I'm going to see Spider-Man turn off the dark. Of course I'm going to the draft. We got Bo Callahan. Well, I guess that's settled. <sighs> yeah, it may be. But we're still going to have to take another look at this kid and everything there is to know about him before I can feel good about what we just risked. Meaning all of our jobs. Um, so here's the thing with Draft Day. It, it is one of these films where it's very quick, very slick. All these scenes going on um, between Kevin Costner's character and his team there, including who you heard in that clip there. Um, um, I forgot what his name now, the actor. Uh, Dennis Leary, who plays the coach of the team. Um, you also have this thing that's going on with him on the phone calling to a lot of the people he's he's calling around to people that the character this um this guy who's like the big number one player that everyone seems to want and they are basically lined up to get he is then phoning around last minute making checks on people and hearing things that are making him question should he pick that guy or should he go with other ones and such um and because of that there's lots of these moments where it, it does these split screen things and there's this weird thing where this split screen but the people are like walking back and forth. They actually walk over the split screens and back and everything. That I found to be really annoying. And that's the only thing I found really to be annoying because the thing is, I really enjoyed this. I have to admit, football, American football films, I'm not a big fan of football at all or sports at all, but I like American football films. And I do enjoy them. Um, I like things like Any Given Sunday, Oliver, Sun Oliver um, Stone's Any Given Sunday. I quite enjoyed the most of it get to the end it's very weird but um it, this is not necessarily a film that you have to know football it kind of you kind of need to know a little bit but most of it is about the way that it's all about the the manipulation the dealing the the finding out the investigating things are happening and, and it's all over this this kind of 12 hour period leading up to the moment when they make the decision and do this or don't do this and they have 10 minutes to do it and it's quite sort of high strung and quite well done and I really did find myself sitting there and kind of cheering for the character and, and going you know I'm getting into this I was really enjoying it it's quite fast paced it's not it does it does sort of slow down every moment again for scenes throughout the day when his character and Jennifer Garner's character um, uh, meet up uh, sort of secretly to try and discuss that news that she's given him that, that morning and it's you know but that's not a problem it stops there it gives you a moment to breathe and then it goes back to the whole wheeling and dealing thing um it's kind of like watching uh you know 
a, a dodgy car dealership, you know, but it's, it's about American football and the ins and outs of that. And that I kind of like. It's it's very unlike. It, it made me think of Moneyball, the the one with Brad Pitt, the about baseball, and how that was all about working out statistics of it. This is kind of the opposite of that. This is all about the. This isn't about the statistics. This is about the wheeling and dealing of getting everything going and and the planning and stuff like that. This isn't about the. Oh, we need this person. We need this person. We need this person. It's it's things that. I want to get this. I want to get this. I, you know, it's it's like give me this. What can I give you? I want to do this. Who is this? You know, it, it's it's very very fast paced, and I found it really quite not amazing, but it got the juices flowing. Lovely weird end of that. Got the juices flowing. <laughs> but dude, I mean, the thing is, it's 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 a film that it's it's nice to see Kevin Costner holding the screen in the way that we know he can. Kevin it, Costner got your juices flowing. <laughs> That's a controversial headline. Power, yeah. um, no, but it's, I mean, it's the thing that if you like Kevin Costner, if you like American football films, then check this out. You will not be disappointed. You might be a bit confused at certain points, but I think you'll come out at the end going, you know what? I enjoyed it. You'll get a lot of people coming out and going, you know what? I'm still confused. <laughs> it's, I, yes, it's a scratching head film, yeah. It's very much like Life After Beth, actually, which is the next film, which will make a lot of people scratch their head during the movie and go, what am I watching? It's directed by Jeff B- Biener. Um, it's rated 15, and it stars uh, Aubrey Plaza and Dean DeHaan. Dean DeHaan plays the lead character in Zack, and Aubrey Plaza plays the title character in Beth. And at the start of the film, she's bitten by a, a snake, and she dies after going on a hike. And she she dies, and obviously this... This um, leaves Zach in a, a sort of like a turbulent kind of mood. He's very, very, very moody because he's just lost his girlfriend. He tries to go around to um, her parents' house, who are played by John C. Riley and Molly Shannon, um, and tries to establish a relationship with them. And he does at the start of it, but then ultimately the start just backing away from him, just like a lot of people do, including uh, Zach's parents and. He goes around to their house every day, Beth's parents' house every day, to try and just, uh, again, play Scrabble to the early, late hours of the morning or, or playing chess, and they're, they're completely ignoring him. Until one day, he discovers why they're ignoring him. And in that case, Beth is not dead. Here's a clip. Zach, Zach you need to go. Where is she? Who? Beth. Listen... You're upset at me for not returning no. your call. No, she is not dead, is she? That's why you've been so Dad, secretive listen. about everything. Am I right? Am I right, Maury? Just tell You're me. You're not right. You're upset. Beth! Listen, Zach. Beth! You need to leave. Beth! No. Zach! Beth! 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 Okay. Okay. Oh, my gosh. Oh my gosh, Maury. Look who I found! It's hey. Beth! All right, calm it's down, Beth. Zach. What are you doing? Hey, hey I have that scarf. What's he supposed to do? He ran around me. He made a juke and he ran what around me. What is going on here? What is going on here? You're acting like a spaz. It's a little bit hard to explain. Yes. How could you do, do this thing. to me, Beth? You made hey, me think. Hey, 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 Zach. She didn't do anything. Everything's normal. This just happened. What just happened? What did no, I do? Nothing happened. It's normal. Just, is you're fine. Normal. Just tell me. Just tell me. Tell me why you shut me up. Tell you what? Zach, why don't you and I go? Go out and have a little conversation. And no, I think that's Maury. a wonderful no, idea. You lied to me. You I never lied. About? Why are you acting all Calm weird? Down. I'm not acting weird. Stop playing dumb, Beth. Oh, I'm not right. playing that is dumb. You're tricking out. You know what? You're all crazy. Listen to me, Zach. You look, need to calm look, this is good. down. This is a- and so, yeah, as you heard in that clip, Beth is not dead. Well, she's sort of dead, but she isn't. In the fact that um, she's a zombie. And he's happy about this in a way. He's happy because the fact that he has got his girlfriend back and he can sort of like tell her how the, where the relationship, sh- relationship has gone wrong and how, the, how he can amend it and be a better person to her. And unfortunately, though, Beth's mood just changes dramatically. There is a scene where they, they go to the beach and she goes completely nuts until she gets in the car and starts listening to jazz. And jazz seems to soothe her down a little bit. However, it's not just Beth that seems to be affected by this. It seems to be a lot of people because around her, an apocalypse has practically happened and where lots of people have turned into zombies and they only seem to calm down when they're listening to jazz. 
Jazz does not do that to me, though. It makes me more angry because it's a really <laughs> annoying kind of music. And so the film itself is, it's very weird. I'll, I'll, I'll say that. It's a it's a zom rom-com in the guise of things like Shaun of the Dead. Even, uh, however, it's not like Shaun of the Dead because it doesn't, Shaun of the Dead is very British in a way. This is very, very suburban American. So yeah, at least it's got that in common with Shaun of the Dead. But the thing with this is, there are funny t- moments in the movie itself, but I was watching the film going, this is really weird. Even for me, it's really weird. Dean DeHaan is very good. I think Aubrey Plaza is fantastic as Beth. Because the way she flips with her character, one minute she wants to hug um, Zach and be really nice to him. The next minute, she practically just wants to rip his jugular out and just numb on him like a zombie would normally do. And so she, she's fantastic at switching that. Um, her parents, played by John C. Riley and Mon- Molly Shannon, are just going at it. They, they've got characters where they can go completely nuts at times, and they're loving their, their characters. The rest of the ones, that, that, that they're more in the background, including Zach's brother, who's a really strange person. He, he's just he's obsessed with his gun, uh, even though he's sort of like more like a neighborhood watch person, and he just he's obsessed with this gun that he's got. There's a, a scene which involves Zach walking in on him when he's polishing his gun in his underwear. It's just really weird, but that, that that sums up the movie to a T. It's a very weird, strange film, and if you after a zombie movie that is not as straightforward as normal zombie movies, then this will be up your path. I kind of agree. I, well, the thing is, I I just found it very, very. It's supposed to be like a, a a comedy about that, and it has dark comedy, but I didn't find it a laugh out loud dark comedy. Which I was really disappointed about. I was expecting there to be a lot more humour in it, um, and a lot there was a lot more opportunity for it, which I felt they kind of missed out. Um, I also felt there was some weirdness to the whole thing of the way Dane DeHaan's character reacted to it. I thought it was a bit. It, it didn't really ring true. I felt to how it possibly would have been, and that's so it, it kind of took me out of it a little bit. Yeah, it's more like head scratching horror rather than just like straightforward horror comedy. Yeah. It's it's just it really does make your head scratch. Even though even if you're used to this kind of film, if you're not sitting there going, okay, um, yeah. at least a couple of times in the film, then it's not doing its job because it is there to just to make you make you have that reaction. Yeah. Right. That's it for the cinema section of the show. We'll be back in a moment after this advert with the home release section. The from from page, page to screen, to screen. So they have nine times out of ten, they have to send it back to you unopened or just throw it in the garbage can. Things don't always look exactly as we envision our life to look, but sometimes it works out and turns out even better. Gregor Fisher, his bacon number is two because he was uh, appeared with January Jones in Love Actually, and January Jones and Kevin Bacon appeared in X Men First Class together. I've got to say, the very Harold and Kumar 3D Christmas. Now that. <laughs> it's about the acting and about the writing. That's really what theatre is for me. Probably had more names than uh, than Prince or whatever. <laughs> Never mind, there's a joke for the oldies. Um, oh, be like, Who's Prince? Who's oh. he? I'd just like to see uh, Mr. Freeze hiring his bad guys going, right, okay, so you're a psycho, right, can you ice skate? Head over to iTunes, Spreaker and Stitcher and put in the search box from page to screen. And we are back with this week's Monday Movie Show. To our Welcome to our DVD and Blu-ray section, our home releases, during which we're going to have a look at the DVD and Blu-ray top ten, and then a look at these new releases. We've got Seth MacFarlane's latest comedy adventure with A Million Ways to Die in the West, um, the big screen animation debut of Mr. Peabody and Sherman, a very small little thriller in Devil's Knot, one of the strangest films I've seen in a very long time in Dark comedy with hints of drama in Space Station 76. We've got uh, Joe, um, a found footage vampire film in Afflicted, Fruitfield Station, and why the series needed a reboot in Leprechaun Origins. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't really sound like the kind of thing you want to have a, a reboot on necessarily, does it? Mm. <laughs> but before that, let's go straight into this week's DVD, uh, sorry, DVD and Blu ray top 10, starting at number. Oh, sorry, one moment. Ten with The Jungle Book. Yep, it's Disney doing a two-for-one special offer kind of thing that they seem to do every single, well, six months, to be honest, to try and get people to buy films that they might have missed. Um, 
Yeah, it's it's the Jungle Book. It's a classic. At number nine is... Sorry, I, I haven't changed screens at the moment. So it's Pompeii at number nine. Yeah, it's directed by Paul W.S. Anderson. It's Paul W.S. Anderson doing a cheesy film. Um, it's not a serious... Well, I, I don't think he's ever actually technically done a serious film. Um, his most serious movies is uh, Soldier and, um, I would say, Event Horizon. But uh, this is... It's not bad. It, it's popcorn entertainment. Kit Harrington, who plays the lead character in the film itself, he's actually... He's okay and... Um, and uh, I forgot. Why do I always forget his name? Kiefer Sutherland. He's chewing the scenery beyond chewing the scenery. So it, it's an entertaining popcorn film. At number eight is uh, also another Disney movie, The Little Mermaid. I can't profess that I really like The Little Mermaid because it's <laughs> not aimed at me. It's not aimed at my sex or my gender, to be honest. It is more for the female side. And or Disney know how. Yeah, all my age, to be honest. I didn't well, watch well, it as a kid. Physical, mental, maybe. Nah, <laughs> mental, I'm actually more akin to a child. But uh, The Little Mermaid, it is aimed at, uh, at girls. Disney know how to do that. They know how to aim specific films at different specific groups. And so they, their masters have been able to do that. Well, they used to be able to do that. And uh, number seven is a new entry for Blended. Yeah, it angered the hell out of me, this movie. It is in my top ten worst films of the year, not because of uh, Adam Sandler, because of the film itself. Adam Sandler's bad in the movie, but at least I could tolerate him more in this film than I could in Jack and Jill. However, it's the film overall in general which angered the hell out of me, and so I hated it. I really did hate it. And number six, another new entry for Postman Pat the movie. Yeah, it's the animation <laughs> style is bad. It's really bad. It, it's it, it's very simplistic, computer generated stuff. It, it's a studio that I'm guessing they didn't have very much of a budget when they were trying to, to find a way to try and bring Postman Pat to the big screen, and they've chosen exactly the same kind of animation style as they have in the TV series. And transferring that from the small screen onto the big screen doesn't work at all. The film itself is really boring as well. Disney's back again at number five with Sleeping Beauty. Again, the the the, the little girls. It it is one of the fairy tales that got princesses in it and things like that. And yeah, it's not aimed at my gen gender. Uh, Bad Neighbors is at number four. It doesn't get funny until around the last ten minutes of the film itself. It's not as annoying as a lot of these frat house comedies can be, where. It, it, it falls down to the lowest of low common denominators where it, it just tries to get laughs from majorly gross out humour. It has elements of that in the film. There are a few scenes where, yeah, they, they, they get very, very close to the line of the gross out humour stuff. But it, it's nice to see them flipping Seth Rogen's um, character on his head, the fact that he doesn't play the the annoying one he plays the the more down to earth one and Zac Efron plays the annoying one in, in the film the the dumb one and it's, uh, it's not a film at number three but it is the complete fourth season of The Walking Dead yeah I gave in on The Walking Dead on series three so mm. okay I, I enjoyed it but we won't go into that because it's TV Frozen is at number two please let it go <laughs> you actually went there um, and it's a new entry at number one for 300 Rise of an Empire. Why? Just just why? Um, I, I think it, it, it's down to the fact that they wanted to see Eva Green um, sex wrestle. Or sex fight. Sex, it, that's, that's a great way of putting it, actually. Sex wrestle is a great way of putting it. it it's, yeah, it, it's that, that scene. It, it, it epitomises the film itself. That, that scene alone the movie itself is 80% slow motion I think they've only got like a 10 minute film in there because the rest of it it is like watching um, a snail run it is that slow the film it, it, it's boring how can a movie with that much action in it be so boring well um, we'll find out similarly how a film like A Million Ways to Die in the West can be well quite so bad considering it's got lots of humorous elements in it um, which is the the release by Seth MacFarlane of Family Guy fame, uh, who last brought us Ted, 
Uh, this time it, it's a western that he's doing in sort of the old sort of western style you've got of um, the the movie set in the hills and, and out in sort of the, the Colorado sort of area and such. Um, you have the whole thing of Seth MacFarlane's the main character who is a sheep farmer named Albert. Um, he lives in this town where um, it's kind of a typical western thing. Um, there are more dangers around than you would think um, sort of with this whole thing of that um, around the, every corner is something that is likely to kill you. As he's explaining to his friend Edward and um, Edward's girlfriend Ruth um, played by Giovanni Rubisi and Silver, Silver, uh, Sarah Silverman even. Uh, here's a clip. We live in a terrible place in time. The American West is a disgusting, awful, dirty, dangerous place. Look around you. Everything out here that's not you wants to kill you. Outlaws, angry drunk people, scorned hookers, hungry animals, diseases, major and minor injuries, Indians, the weather. You, you can get killed just going to the bathroom. See those guys over there? The guys who work in the silver mines? See what they're eating? Ribs doused in hot sauce. They eat hot, spicy foods every meal of the day. You know why? Because their palates are so completely dulled from inhaling poison gas 12 hours a day down in the mines. That's all they can taste. You know what that kind of diet does to your guts? They literally die from their own farts. Into the picture is thrown new characters, um, which you have um, Charlize Theron uh, playing Anna, who is the wife of Clinch, who is a um, kind of a lowest of low, much wanted um, outlaw, played by Liam Neeson. They come into the picture. Albert has recently been dumped by Anna, uh, sorry, by Louise, his girlfriend, played by Amanda Seyfried, um, and so he ends up finding himself hanging around with Anna, unaware that her husband is basically the most wanted man in the West. Um, the thing is that it, if it was just that story, that that kind of simple, that kind of thing, it would actually be a pretty good Western. Unfortunately, it's a Seth MacFarlane film, so it's him trying to do all these jokes, cracking humour with things, you know, um, popping in jokes about bodily humour, uh, bodily functions um, in particular, um, and uh, about all these kind of things, commenting on the West. Um, but the thing is that the jokes that he puts in there, there is one joke in there that genuinely made me laugh in the way that Second Fallen can, and that was a shocking humour moment to do with a, um, a a carnival that they have, a fair, um, where they have a shooting thing, and basically one of these shooting games, and it's a whole thing of you know shooting runaway slaves, and that was the whole thing. That was a great commentary, I thought, and I, that generally shockingly made me laugh. The rest of the film. It's just humour that's really lowest of the low, common denominator. Honestly, you're sitting there and you're going, Seth McFarlane, how far have you fallen from doing something that's genuinely funny? I mean, look at Ted. It was brilliant. It had loads of these, you know, kind of jokes in it, but it had a level of intelligence to it. This does not. It has characters you don't care about. And the, the, I have to say, actually, out of all of them, the character I like the most is Liam Neeson's character because he's genuinely playing it as a serious, cheesy, but serious bad guy. And that I liked. And, and I, I saw this at cinema, really didn't like it. I saw it again now and I have to say I liked it more, but I liked it more for the serious parts in it. I hated the comedy parts. I would just get over that and get on to the next bit. I wanted it to be a serious western. And I would have loved to see Seth MacFarlane do that, but that's not what he's trying to do here. Um, the one thing as well, I would say, there's a great little musical bit in the middle, and I'm not well known for loving musicals. Um, there is a great mustache song bit, the song and dance bit in the middle, which genuinely is bizarrely entertaining. Um, but other than that, and the the joke of the shooting game, I, there's nothing in this that really warrants even renting it to see it. I am scarily I agree because the fact that I love Seth MacFarlane I think Seth MacFarlane is is a genius when it comes to his his humour he adds a very political tinge to his humour at times and he's very relevant because if you look at their Family Guy even though Family Guy is a very scattergun um, TV program the humour in that it is very to the bone and very straight to the point he doesn't care about um, about what society is going to take towards his humour and the way he looks at things and that's what Ted was like, Ted was very much like that, it's got some gah, kind of shocking moments in it but you can't help but laugh and it makes you feel a bit dirty in a way because you're laughing at something you shouldn't be, in this movie he, unfortunately he, it's sort of like he's doing a frat comedy, uh, a gross out kind of 
the hangover style movie in a way even though it doesn't have overly gross out humor in it he's doing that kind of thing and to prove it he had there's a cameo scene in the movie which is just slotted in there just to see it for him to go eh did you see that did did, did you see that scene i did that it's sort of like him being overly boastful and it, it really annoyed me because there are elements in the film which showed you what the film could have been like and unfortunately it's nowhere near as good as ted it is not even in the same state as Ted. No, I completely agree. Right, Mr. Peabody and Sherman, then. It's an animated film. It's uh, the big screen animated debut of uh, Mr. Peabody and Sherman. It was a, it's an American cartoon which was more famous in the, in the 70s, 60s and 70s. Um, we did get it over here, but it's sort of very few people know about it because it's very Americanized. And it sent us around Mr. Peabody, who was voiced by Ty Burrell, um, and uh, he's a talking dog. He's a very intelligent talking dog, really is inst- insanely intelligent talking dog. And he adopts a kid in the form of Sherman, who's uh, voiced by Max Charles. And um, Sherman gets taught by Mr. Peabody. He becomes very intelligent. He, he teaches him things that um, that school would not teach him at his age. And unfortunately, it is about time for Sherman to actually go off to school to ingratiate himself into into groups of uh, kids his own age and when he's at school he ends up doing something stupid he bites one of the pupils when he gets really angry because he says something about George Washington that he believes is true and they think that he's lying and he ends up biting the kid and so Mr Peabody is asked to come to school to to uh, because of his behavior and he comes up with a good idea Mr Peabody to bring the parents of the little girl who who Sherman bit to dinner and to actually tell them what exactly they like and while dinner is happening Sherman alongside now I can't remember the name of the character's name Penny Sherman alongside Penny um, he tells Penny about something that he's not supposed to here's a clip she hates me make it work but don't tell her about the way back Sigmund Freud says if you don't like a person, it's because they remind you of something you don't like about yourself. What do you know about Sigmund Freud? More than you think. Sure. Just like you know all that stuff about George Washington not really cutting down the cherry tree. Ugh, what a crop. But it's true! How do you know? I just know! Did you read it in a book? No! So how do you know, Sherman? How do you know? He told me! Who told you? George Washington! George Washington. Yeah. <laughs> Liar. But don't tell her about the way back. Wow. He calls it the way back. Oh, uh, well, now that we've seen it, maybe we should go back. Are you kidding? Where should we go first? And so you heard there, um, he ends off Sean Penny, the way back. It's a time machine that Mr. Peabody has managed to invent. And obviously Penny wants to see it in action. And they end off in ancient Egypt where King Tut wants to marry Penny. And Sherman can't stop him on his own. So he comes back to present day to get Mr. Peabody's help to try and rescue Penny. And unfortunately, the way back gets damaged and... They have to try and travel to different periods of time to try and piece together the way back so they can get back to their present time. Now, the thing with Mr. Peabody and Sherman is the animation is fine. It, it's nothing impressive, but it, it's nothing like to the bad levels of Postman Pat, for example. It, it's not up there with the brilliance of the Lego movie because that, that's just genius with the, the budget that they had to piece together that film. But it's, it's watchable. It, it's not distracting. It's just not funny, unfortunately, the film. It, it's a kid's movie that it, it relies on humour. It needs to rely on humour because the kind of film that, it's, that it is. And it just isn't, isn't funny. It's, it's an adventure film that's more of an ad rather than a full adventure. It, it's a part of an adventure. And it, I don't think a lot of kids will get majorly enjoyment out of it. They might find it slightly amusing, but that's about it. And... That's the wrong kind of thing for a kid's film. There, there are there are scenes which, which sort of like do toilet humor because they they get catapulted out of the rear end of a sphinx in Egypt, and it it's just yeah okay. There's a also the Trojan horse scene which involves a soldier, which is voiced by Patrick Warburton, 
Um, and so it, it's a lot of stuff which the audience that it's aimed at will not understand. Um, and so by adding humour to that, they're thinking, oh, we can bypass all of that stuff. But it, it just make, it'll just make kids ask more and more questions. And that was the case when I saw this in the cinema. Um, a lot of kids were wondering what what's... Uh, um, what is that big massive horse? What relevant is it? And um, the same with Egypt and when they meet with Leonardo da Vinci and who's that guy? And they were asking tons of questions rather than enjoying the film. And so it proves that it's going to miss more than hit. I was going to add to it as well because I agree it's not a funny film. I didn't laugh at it once when I saw it at the cinema. Um, and I was in a cinema which wasn't packed but it had a fair number in it and it didn't get much laughter there either. But I will say as well, the animation in it, there's nothing wrong with the animation, but it's not exciting animation. There's nothing about it at any point that it gets visually, you're going, ooh, you know, that, that was good. But it's just it just plods along, even on its visual side as well, which is a shame because there was opportunity to do more with it. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I'm going to go on to a completely different film now with Devil's Knot, which is directed by Atom Egoyen. Um, it is a film which is about uh, the true story events that happened in West Memphis um, during the 1990s, uh, early 1990s, where three young boys were killed. Um, and then there was a whole thing about three teenagers that were then arrested and tried and convicted of um, killing them. Um, there have been documentaries that have been done about this, but this is actually a drama which is focusing on the the characters of um, the main character in the film uh, played uh, by Colin Firth of Ron Lax who is a man who is kind of a, an investigator, private investigator who lives in another state but sees this on television and finds himself sort of interested and in wanting to try and figure out what's going on. He goes there, looks into things, uh, meets with some of the parents including uh, one of them played by Reese Witherspoon um, and he's trying to figure out what's going on because he doesn't believe that these three boys are the ones that killed the three the three younger children um, and it, the thing is about it that it's um, it is a drama it's well shot like a drama it's visually well done it's, it's well directed but the problem is with it that the, the, the story is not particularly um, it doesn't really go anywhere is the thing and it doesn't really have anything in it that says this is what it definitely thinks it is this it goes this may have happened this may have happened this may have happened it doesn't it doesn't leave you with anything sort of this character who's supposedly based on a real detective a real person who they never they never seem to reach a hypothesis of what they actually think happened based on what evidence they come across and find it just seems to go into a thing where the problem it has is that it's, it's based on a true story and when you have a thing that's based on a true story you can either do a dramatic retelling of those events or you can do a documentary you cannot do both you cannot do a film that tries to be both this does try to be both but it does it by it starts off as drama then it goes into the whole thing you see the court stuff and then you actually see footage that's been it's not the real footage that was shown that, that was the real stuff because there's, there's footage from the um police holding cells and interviews that are done and i don't believe that it's actually the real footage but it's shown like that full screen as if you're watching it like it's the real documentary footage and that's where i think it loses it it loses its way completely it, it kind of goes uh okay this is how this is how it started then we weren't sure what really happened, so we're just going to go into a documentary from then onwards and tell you what happened afterwards, but not with any confirmed details. So, for me, it's a failure in that regard because of the fact of that it doesn't fully be a drama, it doesn't fully be a documentary, it doesn't even manage to do one of the two. It, it, it tries to do both and fails because of that. But I would say that it's it's nice to see Colin Firth doing something that's different to, to the kind of things we see him in. Um, it's not a great performance from him, but not because of him, but I think just because of the fact there's not much there for him to work with in the writing of it, which is the thing. Because, I mean, it's written by Scott Derrickson, um, who did um, Sinister, uh, who wrote and directed Sinister. So, I mean, it's a, it's a man who has got skill, but I think this was possibly done on a more of a... Uh, oh, this is but there's this thing that happened. I better write a thing about it, but it's not really been all oh, this thing has happened and this happened and this happened and this happened. It's not really been gone into at length, and it should have been. Yeah, if if, if you want that, I highly recommend you watching the Paradise Lost documentaries because that that's based on um, the murders that that uh, the three kids supposedly did, and 
that's stretched over the period of I think it's twelve years. There's three parts to the documentary, and it follows them over that over that time in the twelve years. And I, that was the major problem I had with the movie. It didn't know how to pace that out. It didn't know how long to concentrate on each section of the film, um, and it just it doesn't actually do the last part justice about the when it when you find it exactly what happens yeah. it doesn't do that it justice at all the film itself i think it's pointless and when you've got a brilliant documentary brilliant three-part documentary out there and with the paradise lost films because i've seen each one of the paradise lost films um when you've got a documentary that explores it to its full extent and then you've got a drama that does absolutely nothing with it the movie just is, is a pointless film it's unfortunate as well because um, Colin Firth is a really good actor. It, it does not do um, Colin Firth justice at all. It mm. makes you question, why did he choose to do the role in the first place? The thing as well is, with it, I mean, it's not saying that it's a badly put together film because there's, there's some moments in it, there's genuinely some really good moments. There's a quite a harrowing scene when the bodies of the boys are found and it's, it's shot, well, respectfully, but it's done properly. It's not a quick oh quick that's it. it 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 genuinely was like one of these moments where when i first saw it i was kind of like oh that's you know that's really gut punching and it was effective but it just doesn't do that for the rest of the film it loses its way and it loses its way and basically ends up you know far far off the reservation where it's meant to be exactly right there next up is space station 76 this is oh it's a <laughs> really strange movie it's a uh, it's rated 15, and it's a comedy drama of sorts. It has drama elements to it, but it's a very weird comedy. It's not like a slapstick comedy, and it's not dark comedy. And it, it's, it's a really weird movie to put into any kind of category. It defies a lot of genres. It's directed by Jack Plotnick. And it, it is harking back to the, the science fiction films of the 70s, so it has that kind of loose feel to it loose look like the the fact that the sets do look like they're made of plastic rather than being properly believable spaceships and stuff and it, it stars patrick wilson who plays the character of captain glenn and um who's on this refueling satellite that's what the the space station is and a new crew member in the form of jessica she arrives she's played by uh, Liv tyler she's going to be the first mate on the station itself and she tries to get herself into the group of people the, the small little a group of people that is on the space station at first just find it really difficult because she's she's realizing how much cabin fever is on board this this space station how much people are getting on everybody's nerves and she can't engross it herself with with all of them because there is one character on the on the space station who hates her um she tries to manipulate her daughter and turn her around saying oh what what she's seeing is actually evil and when she's the manipulative one and so it just follows into their lives about them until a secret comes out and uh, a little disaster happens where it forces them in a way to sort of work together in the last five minutes of the film. Like I said, the movie itself is really strange. It, after I um, watched it, I was sitting there thinking to myself, I actually don't know what to think about this movie. <laughs> It, it's interesting when films do that, make you think about what you've watched rather than you instantly being able to make a judgment at the end of the film. It's still making me think now, did I like the film? And I can't answer that. I just can't. I don't know if I did like the film enough. Um, there is humour in the movie itself, but it didn't make me laugh. There is drama in the film itself, but it didn't make me like um, feel the drama. Yet I didn't hate the film. So even though the elements of the film that it was trying to fit into the genre I didn't like, I didn't hate the film at all. It just, I found it really strange and perplexing. And I still do not know what to fully think about the film. I know as a reviewer, that's a stupid thing to say, but at least it's going to make me think more about the movie. And not me, I'll probably have a eureka moment and wake up during the middle of the night and go, that's what I think about the film. And if that's the case, I'll do a special episode of the show just to see what I thought about the movie. But it, it's bewildering and I, I'm still scratching my head. It's a very nostalgic film about for those films like Silent Running and Dark Star and those kind of things like that. And yeah. it's the, the, the pre-Star Wars space movies, well, yeah, pre-Star Wars space movies that did all these kind of um, 
like Buck Rogers style things, you know, that kind yeah. of thing. It's it's very, very reminiscent of that. But it has an adult sen- sense of yes. humour to it because yes. there's <laughs> elements in the film which when you when very you watch adult. the trailer you'll think this is um, might be a decent little uh, family film. Well god no. No, no. No, not at all. Um Joe, which is uh, the movie directed by David Gordon Green, is based on the novel by Larry Brown. Um, and stars Nicolas Cage as the title character, Joe. Um, though he's not really sort of front and centre for the majority of the film, um, during which uh, there is instead is a main character of Gary, played by Ty Sheridan, um, a boy who has come into this um, sort of uh, kind of redneck town a bit. Um, he's there with his father. His father is a, uh, well, basically he's a drunk uh, bum. He can't get work. He can't um, really sustain himself. He's stealing money off of his son all the time to buy alcohol. Um, And um, Gary ends up sort of wandering around, finding himself in amongst all these group of um, these loggers. He's mainly been cutting down trees and doing work on that. um, Who their foreman is Joe, played by Nicolas Cage. Here's a clip. Hey, mister. Yeah? I got a question for you. You see me and my daddy just got into town. I was wondering if you'd... Give us a job, we're looking for work. <coughs> How old are you? Fifteen. Well, you got 45 seconds to tell me why I should hire you. I built hay before I worked on a truck. I, I picked tomatoes, uh, uh, zucchini, cucumbers, uh, okra, squash. All right, that's, that, you're not afraid of work. Good. What's your name? Gary Jones. I'm Joe. I pay a day's pay for a day's work. I pay on Fridays, so you get a little something today. Okay. But your first real payday is next Friday. We start about six in the morning, quit at one or two. And if we work till dinner and get rain out, I pay for the whole day. Does that sound fair enough? Yes, sir. All right. Follow this line of trees. Yes, sir. Close to a half mile back to my truck. Juice hatchets are in the back. Yes, sir. You get yourself one, fill it up with poison, yes, and come sir. on back same way you went out. Yes, sir. And don't get lost. I won't. Hey! Do you want to know how much you're getting paid? Um, the movie is then sort of focused more a bit after that on Joe. Um, and the thing of that he's a guy who's... He is basically a man who's who's previously been in prison. He's now out. He's got himself on the path. But he has um, anger issues and problems with his behaviour. And um, sort of the slightest thing can set him off. And it's all about then him leading this life and realising the fact that he needs to get control of himself but also then showing that there's this option of giving him himself a way to do this by being able to sort of help out Gary and, and show Gary what a real person should be instead of what the father he's got at the moment um, the thing is that it's not a great film, it's not a brilliant film but it is seriously put together, well put together good drama and surprisingly of all the thing that stands out about it and holds it together keeps it from sort of falling apart and and getting boring at points is that Nicolas Cage gives a really good performance in it and I'm not talking a a really good Nicolas Cage performance I'm talking a really good actor performance not normally worthy of Nicolas Cage what you think of when you think Nicolas Cage actor and I honestly was completely sort of flummoxed when I saw it and I like you know, Nicholas Cage is actually bringing the acting to this. He's doing it. He's doing a good job, and he's really good. There's some moments when he's kind of losing his temper and stuff, and he's he almost goes Nicholas Cage back crap crazy, but reins himself in and just goes angry and and does that. And, and I gotta say, I like Nicholas Cage acting like this. I'd love to see him doing this more in films. I don't know if we will or not at the moment. I doubt it from things we've seen, but. It kind of, and it's even more annoying as well because it shows he can do it. And the thing is, well, it's it's kind of like I, I want to kind of say maybe this is partly down to Ty Sheridan because this is Ty Sheridan, the boy who we'd seen only before in Mud with Matthew McConaughey, who also in that film ended up giving a great performance. So Ty Sheridan seems to be the one who's brought out a great performance, as far as I'm concerned, in Matthew McConaughey and Nicolas Cage. Well done. <laughs> He needs a big massive pat on the back for being able to do that, then. Yeah. Uh, Matthew McConaughey has surprising. actually become a brilliant actor anyway, but has, uh, yeah. out of Nicolas Cage, can he actually star in Liam Neeson's next movie, then? If that's well, the case. 
I mean, well, I haven't seen it yet, but that was, what was that one that there was rage? Um, the one he, he he's already following in, Nicol- in Liam Neeson's footsteps, isn't he? After doing Taken, uh-huh. he's he's doing what's it called? Talk. I can't remember the name. Oh, uh, Tokarev. Tokarev, yeah. <laughs> He's, yep. he's done that, so he's already done, I mean, what do we need next? We need, we need Nicolas Cage on a plane. Um, we've got that in Con Air going back, but we need to, his next film needs to be on, on a plane, and his next film needs to be after that, a Western. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> right, their next film is Afflicted. It's directed by Derek Lee and Cliff Prowse, and it stars both Cliff Prowse and Derek Lee as Derek and Cliff. So it's not very inventive when it comes to their character names, is it? Um, it's a found footage film. This actually is a found footage film because the footage is lost and it's found at the end of the film. So that's not giving anything away. That, that's my definition properly of a found footage film. It centers around uh, two friends who decided to ultimately take the trip of a lifetime but record absolutely everything that they're doing. So unlike with a lot of these movies where their bangs are having them because a ghost is taking over a household and they decide to set up cameras, the cameras have a point. They are filming their holiday in a way. It's just them filming the last month together as friends before they each split off and do their own thing. And so they decide to go on a world uh, trip around the world. They stop off in um, in Prague um, and something happens to, to Derek. He starts to get really ill. Um, something strange happens to him. His body starts to deteriorate. And then he starts to come back and realizes he's able to jump really far and he's able to do things that he wasn't able to do previously he's a clip okay look i'm fine all right you're not fine okay let's just go home no we're not going home we're not going anywhere we're staying right here let's test come on let's test (laughs) derek what are you doing derek you're freaking me out right now just stop okay come down from there Okay, Cliff, here it is. If I make this next jump, that proves that I am not sick. What? No! This isn't gonna prove anything! And so the thing that's taken over Derek's body seems to be properly taken over until he starts to lose it ultimately and bad things happen, which forces Derek to seek out the true meaning of the disease or the thing that he's been given um, to try and stop it. Now, found footage movies are, are plentiful. There are hundreds. I was going to say thousands, but that would have been a, an over-exaggeration, sort of. There are hundreds. They're, they're, it's a very easy um, genre of horror to shoot into. It's a very easy genre of any kind of film to shoot into because the fact that it doesn't take a lot of money to be able to, to shoot a found footage movie. And a lot of them are, are stagnant because they, they've, they just take the same idea that's been done hundreds and hundreds of times before and doesn't do anything different. Afflicted is sort of like, it's sort of like that. It takes the the premise that somebody is getting um, infected by something and ultimately changing. But it's an interesting film because both characters, they've got a proper friendship together. And so rather than following like multiple characters and bumps in the night and all that stuff, it's uh, at its heart, it's all about these two best friends and then what's happening to change one of them to ultimately fracture their friendship. And it, it, it's nice to have that at, at its heart. When it gets to the horror side of it, it is really creepy at times. It's nice and dark. Um, it doesn't rely on the bang loud scares because it has no scares in the film. But it doesn't intend to have the scares in the film. It doesn't need the big loud bangs. And so it doesn't use any of that stuff. And I actually really like The Flicted. It's a rare found footage movie that, that takes that genre and does something a little bit different with it. And I watched it a little while ago, and I still remember the film, and I, I'm still really interested in the film. I'm definitely going out and buying a copy of it, and I, I highly recommend you do the same. I'm surprised by that. Um, okay, so the last film this week um, I've got... For is, you. 
for me yeah, it's Fruitville Station um, it is directed and written by Ryan Coogler it is based another one on true events that happened in 2008 um, and I'm not going to say what it was that happened because it, you don't need to know that going into it but it's the true story of uh, a day following a character or uh, a person played by Michael B. Jordan plays Oscar Grant um, who's going around his, his normal everyday life it is uh, New Year's Eve in 2008 um, and he's going through his dates and it leads up to an event that happens at the end of the day um, and the thing is with it, it it's kind of it, it's looking back a bit through the events of his life he's had problems with the police he's had problems with his family and he's not getting on with them as well so much um, and we see through the events of that day and through flashbacks during that day um, one of the scenes is a flashback where he meets his he sees his mother Octavia Spencer when he's being held at a sort of young offenders institute place and she comes to visit him here's a clip I'm not coming here for these visits anymore this is my last time. I know I know I know I know this is the last time for me too I, I told you that I ain't going down you no keep more. putting Sophina through this and you go right ahead okay but Tatiana that baby doesn't deserve this Oscar you don't know what's going on so I guess that's why she asked me why you love taking your vacations more than you like being with her. Come on, you gotta tell her I love her. Tell her, tell her I ain't never gonna Tell leave her yourself. Her. The next time you call home, you tell her yourself. Or better yet, let her come visit you here. Yeah, but I don't. She don't need to be exposed. You already point. exposed it. You already exposed it to this. So you gonna leave me? You gonna leave me again? What kind of mom is you? I'm in here by myself. I love you, Austin. Man, you don't love nothing. I do. And I'm praying for you. I'll see you when you get home. Get my hold up. Let me get a hug, Ma. Grant. Hey, Ma, I can't get Back a hug. Back to the visiting area, Grant. Hey, Ma, I'm sorry. Grant. So here's the thing with Fruitful Station, I have an issue with it, and it's not the same thing, it, it doesn't do the same, the problem I had with um, Devil's Not Earlier, it doesn't start off with a drama and then go into documentary, it does stay all the way through to the end of the film being a drama about things that happened, but the thing I have an issue with is that it's the way that it's done and it does these things where you jump back to flashbacks of the characters past as you heard that clip there that I found it felt as if it was particularly being manipulative for the main character for, for your opinion of the main character and, and the way that you see the main character and that I found very obvious and honestly found it quite distractingly misleading and really kind of watching it and as it went on I kind of found myself sitting there watching it going well, I'm being told that, I'm being shown this, I'm being shown this, but it's based on a real person that we don't really know that about. So it kind of takes a real story, and obviously it's a drama based on real events. But for me, it felt as if it was a drama that then became fiction and didn't really stick to what it was trying to do, which is tell a story of something that happened. It felt like it was trying to justify the story and what happened and things that happened. And that I found very kind of almost kind of like a propaganda misleading piece and I found that very distasteful to be honest I found it very off-putting by the end of the film we got to the end and I was kind of left sort of conflicted in that I should have felt one way but I felt another way and not because of the story of the events that happened but because of the way that the film tried to portray them and the way that the film tried to portray the characters so for me it felt like it was trying to manipulate me and obviously so much so that I was kind of in a reflective way I was I, in a reflex back backwards to it, I kind of went no I'm not interested in that. and so for me it doesn't connect it didn't work and I found that it, it just was unfortunately a complete fiction as, as much as I've looked into the events afterwards and it's accurate to what events uh, are known I found I couldn't connect with it I found it very very disconnected and I, I'm, I'm the opposite. I really like Fruitvale Station. I think Michael B. Jordan is fantastic in the film he itself. Is, he is, yeah. um, I, I think the film itself is. is it, I really, really liked it to to explore the the 24 hours before the heinous incident that happened. The fact that it just shows you the abuse of power that a lot 
of um, a, a lot of the big companies in, in America have, especially in this case, the police, how, how abusive, how much they overuse their power. And so it, it like it is based on a true story and the, the results of it are out there. And so when you do watch it, it has such a punch behind it that it, it did it did knock me back a little bit. There is a scene in the film itself which actually it brought me to tears a little bit. It, it, it involved was the dog that gets knocked over and instead of his character just walking off and leaving it behind he sits there with it and so I, I loved that scene there and it just shows you what kind of life he was like he, he was trying to change his life around he was trying to provide mm. for his family and I know that's a lot to put into a 24-hour uh, period and I can see where you're coming from with the manipulation trying to change your mind about what he's like at the start of the film ultimately leading up to the incident that's happening and um, trying to force you to see it. Oh, he has changed his life and he's going to be able to, but then that thing happens. So I can see where you're coming from with the manipulation, but I actually really like the film. Mm, okay, well, I mean, it's, yeah, I can see what you mean as well, but for me, just I couldn't connect with it. I found that very, as I say, disconnective. <laughs> no, I really liked yeah. it. Um, final film. I No, I intentionally... Um, put the line up this week uh, so Leprechaun Origins would be the final film because normally I, I like to end off the, the DVD and Blu-rays with sort of like the bargain basement movie the movie that you would find at the bottom of a basket in a ten pence store and so I, I, ten pence, oh, come on yeah, trust me. That no, <laughs> trust me. That that is the case when it comes to Leprechaun Origins. It's directed by Zach, Zach Lipovsky and instead of using Warwick Davis from the previous Leprechaun films, they've done exactly the same as what the what Dimension did with Hellraiser. They kicked Doug Bradley out and got some other stupid, stupid person to play a Pinhead in the the Hellraiser films. In this case, they got the WWE wrestler Hornswoggle to play mm -hmm. the Leprechaun. Yeah, exactly. Who? And it, it follows exactly the same kind of premises you've seen in multiple horror films before. Two teenage couples. Um, go to Ireland on a holiday. They end up in a small town. They're told a, a, a story about this creature that inhabits the, the undergrowth of the of the area out in, in Ireland itself, um, and they ultimately have to survive against this creature. Now, in the previous Leprechaun films, it's a dark comedy, with Warwick Davis playing the titular character of the Leprechaun, and having a hell of a lot of fun doing it. Yeah, the movies became a major pastiche of themselves when you got to Leprechaun in Space and Leprechaun in the Hood. They actually did a sequel to That's, Leprechaun in the Hood. That I know, a great but they, title. <laughs> they did a sequel to In the Hood. So That's there's Leprechaun, Leprechaun in the Hood 2. Oh, come on. They could have done something better than that. So, yeah, there is a sequel to that. And Warwick Davis played uh, the Leprechaun in each one of them ones. And so his character was, you, you saw this one who was obviously doing the stereotypical Leprechaun thing and wears me pot of gold and Irish people were rolling around going, oh, God. Um, yeah, if he says potato, then I'm actually going to walk out of the cinema. <laughs> now, what they've done with this one is they've took Hornswoggle, they've chucked away all the humour and made him look like an imp. He looks like a mutated... Actually, he looks like a cross between a mutated pickle and an imp. <laughs> that, that, they, they try to make it so serious. When you do finally see the leprechaun character, it, it's just laughable because the prosthetics and things like that, what they've done, is just ridiculous. The film itself is absolutely horrendously bad. It is on a level that not even stoners would find amusing, to be honest. It is really that bad. It's not... It, there, there is very little gore in it. There's very little cohesion to it. There's very little... Just anything to the movie at all. I don't even think that the director has seen a Leprechaun movie. I just think that it's one of those instances where the movie company was going to lose the rights to the Leprechaun um, name and the Leprechaun movies, and they quickly threw out this, because that was the same with Dimension. They were about to lose the rights to the Hellraiser series, um, and it was taken so long for them to do the reboot that they got some guy in to make a Hellraiser movie for fifty thousand dollars, which is how much it cost. This one looks like it was done like like they went out trick or treating with a few kids and got them to do the movie for them. It honestly it is rotten. It's rotten to the core. 
Just rem- think of that. A mutated pickle crossed with an imp. If that scares <laughs> you, then I feel sorry for you. It doesn't really scare me. It actually makes me quite sort of... Um, Intrigued curious. to see it. Just yeah. yeah, just just Google <laughs> Leprechaun Origins and you'll see a picture of him and you'll understand it does look like a mutated pickle mixed with an imp. That should put that should go in the poster, yeah. <laughs> featuring a mutated pickle. Was it? Was it? Sorry, mutated pickle looking like an imp. Yeah. <laughs> okay, um, that's it for this week's show. Uh, before we go and uh, finish wrap up, we're going to go quickly into TV movies of the week. Um, do you want to go first? Because you've got a couple. In fact, do you want to do one of yours? Because you've got two. You cheated, and I've got I one know. film. Um, the Crazies. Okay. Which is, um, it's a remake of uh, the George A. Romero film. The George A. Romero film came out in the late, uh, the sort of like the 70s. And it was a bit, meh, it was a bit of a miss movie. This one's got Timothy Oliphant in it. And I really, really like this one. It's one of those rare occasions where the remake is better than the original by a long margin. The only other film where I can think of where the margin is that big um, is The Thing. I know I really... No, gone. I really like uh, Dawn of the Dead. Dawn of the Dead, uh, the Zack Snyder film, it is really, really good. But both films, both Dawn of the Dead movies, are brilliant. Um, this one, The Crazies, is miles better than the George A. Romero version of the film. I was going to say, I think I remember seeing parts of the George A. Romero one when I was younger. Uh-huh. Um, and it's just this, uh, it's just one of these weird things. I do remember seeing parts of it, and I remember having this thing of. I remember it being very much like um, Night of the Comet. It's very like that, it, but it's really yeah. boring. This <laughs> one, this one, it, it's there is a lot of suspense in it, and I think Timothy Oliphant is one of the is a very underrated actor in a way. I, I even know a lot of people hate Hitman. I think he was actually really good as Agent Forty Seven in Hitman. They got the casting right, and it's just the film itself is rubbish. Um, t- Timothy Oliphant in in the Crazies is fantastic. I I, I really like the Crazies. Good film. Okay, and my my TV movie of the week, which is on twice, but it's just the same, the same film, on film four. I know I'm going to get flack for it, because you've already gave me flack before we started the show. Um, and it's Titanic. And it's on nice. film four on Tuesday the 7th at 9pm. Um, and it's on Sunday 11th again, um, but it's on then at 5.20, which I suspect will possibly have some edits made to it at that time of the day. Um, but I, I do like Titanic. I think it's, it is a grand epic film. I don't think it's James Cameron's best film. It's not by a long shot, but um, I actually think that's The Abyss, and I'll probably get even more hate for that. No, um, I actually but... really like The Abyss, surprisingly. Oh, brilliant. Um, we agree on something else. Uh, no, because his no, best I... film is Aliens. No, sorry. Um, it's a great film, it is, there, but um, we're not going to that. But yeah, Titanic, I really do love the scale of it, the scale of it, and um, I think probably the first film that made people realise that Leonardo DiCaprio wasn't just an annoying uh, teen actor; that he could actually be really, really good and and hold the hold the screen. Yeah, my other TV movie of the week is a fantastic little um, animated film that was overlooked by a lot of people. It's on Channel Four on Sunday the twelfth at ten past four. So ignore Titanic and watch this instead. Um, it's a monster in Paris. Uh, the, the only problem I have with the way Channel 4 has shown it is they've shown it in the English language dub. Um, it's a French film, originally a French film. Vanessa Parody does a, a character in the, the French version of it. And I, I think that you should watch them in the original language that they intended to meet. Uh, like Belleville Rendezvous does not work in English. It's brilliant in French. It's a very weird film. That This one, I love it. A Monster in Paris is a fantastic little kids film that... I implore kids to watch it because it's a, it's an animated film that they'll have not heard of. I okay. implore everybody to watch it, to be honest. Okay. Uh, that's it for this week's show. Thank you for listening to us live, if you have been, or downloading us on the podcast after the fact. Um, you can always find us at mondaymovieshow.co.uk. Find us on Twitter at mondaymovieshow. Stuart's on there also is at... at cryptic tadpole i'm on there at ahdvd you can find us on facebook.com forward slash monday movie show um and we would recommend as well a few of our friend sites that we do some sort of work with um you have following the nerd.com you have from page two the number two screen.com and um also we'd give a shout out to our charity that we do support uh, recommend uh seren foundation our s-e-r-e-n foundation.org.uk so 
that's it for this week's show uh, before we leave you and play out with a clip of an upcoming film from next week movie of the week despite its ending I would Gone have Girl. to say Gone Girl yep I agree completely um, absolutely fantastic film but bear in mind take a cushion with you because you will get a bit of a sore bottom sitting that long yeah bottom I can't I'm not going to do that voice because I, I don't have very much of a voice to do a minion <laughs> Okay, fair enough. Uh, that's it, though, until next week. Uh, when We'll be back again on Monday. Um, the Next week we'll be covering, among other things, uh, the new release of The Mage Runner, which is based on the book. Uh, looks to be a fantastic film. Um, you can check out the trailer online as well. And um, we'll be, we will leave you with a clip for that until next week when we'll review that. Until then, bye-bye. Bye. My name is Albie. Like, can you tell me anything about yourself, who you are? What is this place? Let me show you. Hope you're not afraid of heights. Let's go. Come on. This is all we got. Out there. We only have three rules. First, do your part. Second, never harm another glader. Most importantly, never go beyond those walls. <laughs>